Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first presentation of the GoOn webinar series. The GoOn webinar series is presented by GoOn, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, by the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, and IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to GOON, it is a collaborative international network designed to improve our understanding of global OA conditions, to improve our understanding of ecosystem responses to OA, and to acquire and exchange data and knowledge necessary to optimize modeling for OA and its impacts. GOON has over 800 members from 105 countries and has eight regional hubs spanning from the Arctic to the Pacific Islands. We are glad to have over 131 individuals present for today's session, and we welcome anyone who is not currently a member of GOON to join the GOON community. My name is Michael Aquafreda, and I work with GOON as a Secretariat member, and I'm also a Knauss Fellow working at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. I'll be moderating today's webinar. During the presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type any questions into the questions box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We do ask that you specify the speaker you're directing your question to. We'll be monitoring incoming questions, and we will pose them to our speakers during the question and answer session, which will begin immediately after the last, or immediately after this presentation. We encourage you to pose questions or share your insights on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and on Twitter using the hashtag GoOnWS. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be available through the GoOn YouTube channel. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Sam Dupont is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Sam's main research topic is on the effect of global changes like ocean acidification and warming on marine ecosystems. He has published in more than 180 he has published more than 180 publications in journals including Nature, PNAS, and Tree. He is a member of the advisory board of the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center and the Executive Council of the Global OA Observing Network. Go on. Steve Whittacombe is a professor and director of science at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the United Kingdom. Steve is a marine ecologist with 30 years of experience in using field observations and large manipulative experiments to address the effects of natural and anthropogenic disturbances on the structure, diversity, and function of marine organisms and communities. This work has been published in more than 150 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. Since 2005, much of his research has focused on understanding the biological impacts of ocean acidification. Steve also has a particular interest in monitoring the marine environment, and in late 2019, he helped establish the Northeast Atlantic Regional Hub of GOON. Starting this month, Steve has taken the role as co-chair of GOON, GOON's Executive Council. So with that, I will now turn the presentation over to Sam and Steve. Uh, Sam, I will now make you the presenter. Thank you very much. And you can take it away. Here we go. So let's see, is everything okay? You can see my screen? I guess you do. Yes, uh, you're good fantastic. to go. Thank you very much. So th thanks a lot for the introduction, Mike. It's, it's really nice to be uh, together, Steve and myself, able to, to start this seminar series. Uh, and that's, uh, we'll give a little bit of background of, of, of uh, where the, this presentation is coming from. But there is something, yeah, thank you for the introduction of both Steve and myself. But there's something you, you missed and very important aspect is that Steve and myself are actually the founding members of the world famous Ocean Acidification Mojito Club. And that's something maybe we should revise at some point, Steve. But anyway, we are also representing the biology working group of GOAN. And that means we have the people you can see on the picture, Yuri, JD, Claudine, Kirsten, Jan, Mark, uh, that all contributed to this presentation. So on the menu today, we're gonna to have four different parts. First, I'm gonna give a brief introduction about the work of the biology working group of GOAN. Then Steve will start 
uh, presenting what will be like really the meat of, 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 the, of the presentation, which is uh, what to monitor if you want to monitor biology in the context of ocean acidification and present a strategy that is focusing on monitoring the rates of change. And then I will go a little bit more in detail for that and see like where and how long uh, you want to monitor if you start a project like that and how you can estimate these things. And then we will be back uh, with Steve discussing a bit what kind of indicators you want to measure. So I will start now just by introducing a little bit the, the biology working group. So as you, many of you know, uh, Goan uh, started in 2012 with a meeting in Seattle and Steve and myself were already there. And I remember that from the very beginning of Goan, which, and you know, Goan is a monitoring and observing network. The biology was really at the heart of it. So we, we realized that from the very beginning that acidification is not the chemical issue. It's, it's both the combination of the chemistry and the biology that will provide us with the tools that we need if we want to address and minimize acidification at the societal level. So from the very beginning, biology was at the core of what Goan wanted to achieve. And to do that, if you want really to, to focus on the biology, you have multiple tools that you can use. And experiment studies or field work are one of those of, the, of these many options. So you can either decide I'm going to do the work in the lab and have really control conditions and, and test hypothesis and understand the mechanisms. And on the other side, you can also decide I'm going to work in the field and, and make observations in the field along gradients, for example, or take advantage of natural analogs like CO2 vents. And that's really interesting too, because then you have a more realistic picture of, of what is happening, but of course you have less control. So it's always a trade-off between how much control you want to have over your, 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 your experiments or how much realism you have. And it's really hard to have both. And, and, and you've seen that, that graph many times, I'm sure, but basically all of these approach are important. Not one is more important than another because what we want ultimately is understanding the long-term effect, uh, allowing to have evolution in the game, on multiple drivers and at the scale of the ecosystem. And at, the, at this time still, we are still focusing on the other side, which is like single drivers, single species and short period of time. But all these tools can contribute one way or another to, to reach that goal, to have like a more holistic view of what's gonna happen. And again, you have a lot of tools that you can use. You have experiments, but you also have modeling. You can go in the past and check what happened, the paleo approach. You can also do a, a lot of like field work in terms of observation with experiments and laboratory, of course. But biological monitoring is one of these approach that has not been used much in the field yet. And, and that's an approach that is very interesting because it, it is the most realistic approach we can get. We're gonna, we are gonna have observation in the real world and, uh, with the, the, the right rate of change and so on. So that's, that was one of the mission we had with the biology working group is that we wanted to define how to do biological monitoring in the right way as an additional tool to this toolkit we have to address and understand acidification. But what to monitor is really the next question. And, and I remember we had working groups in, in the meeting in St. Andrews discussing exactly that, like what do we want to measure? And if you ask that question to one biologist, you're gonna have a list. If you ask to another biologist, you're gonna have another list. And that's why at the end, when all this information was summarized in, in many of the Goan documents, we ended up with a really long list of measurements. Many things like that we would like to measure if we really want to understand what's gonna happen out there. The problem with that is that it turns to be quite unrealistic because we have too many parameters. Some of those are quite complicated to measure. And also there was the, the issue of comparing. If you compare different locations, the different regions of the world or different, different, different countries, it's gonna be sometimes be very difficult because of the diversity of approach, of methods, of indicators and so on to compare. So that's what uh, do that better really was one of the mission of the biology working group it was really to integrate more biology into goan and the first uh, biology working group meeting was a virtual one and it was organized in 2015 and kirsten and myself were a uh, co-chair of, of this initiative and, and from this very first meeting we had a lot of really good ideas but the problem was that most of the people you can see on this list are very busy people and, and, and doing something extra on top of that was, was probably a little bit too demanding. So 
after the meeting, things faded a little bit away, but then we had a second kick in 2016 where we had a really productive meeting organized in, in Monaco at the IAEA. And during that time, we, can, we tried to, to formalize a little bit more what was the mission of the working group. And we agreed on three different tasks. One was to inform the chemical monitoring program of the biological needs. The second one was to evaluate the needs and requirement of a biological monitoring program. And finally, another one was to develop a theoretical framework linking chemical changes to, bio, to biological response. And over the years, we made progress on all these lines. But it's really, it was really at the beginning of last year that we had a second meeting organized uh, in Sweden, in, in my institution, and we decided to focus on, on the second task, which is really evaluate the needs and requirement of the biological monitoring program. And we spent a few days working only on that. And at the end, we had the, the a skeleton of a good draft of a good manuscript, and we've been working on that till now. I know we have a final manuscript ready, and in a way, one of the goal of, of this presentation is to share ideas and also have feedback from the community. So please don't hesitate to be critical, to send us feedback, because we, we aim at submitting this paper uh, in, 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 a, in a couple of weeks or months uh, month maximum. So please, we are, we're gonna take all of your feedback. So that's, that was a little bit the, the background, the story of, of the, the working group and the, how we, we came with that story. And now I'm gonna pass the mic to, to Steve, who's gonna start really to present the concept that we've been working on. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Can you, you hear me okay? I do. Yeah, yeah okay. Yes, I assume great. everyone else. That's great. Hi, Mike from the ether there. Hi there. Um, thank you, Sam, for that, that great introduction. Um, I'll start with an apology. It's not normal that I would I would present slides with so much text on them. Um, so apologies, everyone. I normally like to distract people with a few pretty pictures to, uh, to take them away from some of the, the things I'm saying. But um, what I was keen to do in this presentation was make sure that should my somewhat flaky rural Wi-Fi fall out, at least the information is there so people can, can follow it and it becomes slightly intuitive. I'd really like to pick up on one of the things sort of Sam um, began to introduce in, in, in his first few slides. And this, this is about what Goan is about. I mean, Goan is not just about individuals going out monitoring, looking for effects in their, in, you know, in their own environment. This is about what can we do that's more powerful collectively as a network. So the key challenge here is primarily about how do we start to collect biological data that is not only relevant to the individual who's collecting it for their own situation, but also enables us to make larger, more synthesized appreciations of what the biological impacts are. So how do we compare across different conditions in different places? And since its conception, Goan has, has done an incredible amount of work in terms of the chemical oceanography monitoring of ocean acidification. The idea of bringing up expertise to allow uh, OA monitoring right across the world uh, from lots of different places, adding new monitoring stations, new data sets. But in an essence, and, and not wanting to um, in any way disparage any of the chemical oceanographers in the audience, but to be honest, chemistry is easy. You know, compared to biology, the, the concept of the carbonate chemistry changes, in essence, rotates around, you know, four well-established carbonate chemistry parameters. So as long as you measure a couple, a couple of them, you can kind of get a, get a handle on what ocean acidification is doing in a chemical sense. Now, when you turn your mind to biology, you realize that then suddenly we're in a whole different world of complexity in the fact that, Ocean acidification and elevated carbon dioxide you know, is a well-established part of natural ecosystems and organisms have evolved to respond and react to changes in CO2 levels across a whole range of physiological, behavioral, ecological processes. So what do we actually want to, to measure and what do we actually want to, to try and link back to ocean acidification. And I think what's really important is to keep in mind as well this global aspiration of the network and really recognize that not everyone will be able to measure the same things uh, in terms of the, the biological impact data because they may not be relevant to your particular situation where you are. 
and also it may not be relevant to the skills that particular groups have or, or, or the capacity they have to make those observations. So we started from a point not about making the community conform to a small set of biological observations, but it was how can we find a way to bring this wealth of biological knowledge together to create something that was much bigger and, and much more incisive because of the amount of data that was then available to us. And of course, these kind of approaches aren't necessarily new. We've seen uh, in, in published metadata analysis, ways in which you can start to bring uh, different types of data together that, that are measured over different scales with different indicators by using something called effect sizes. So understanding how things are changing from a, from a relative baseline position. And this was the, the approach we thought we'd we try to start to explore with the concept of a global biological monitoring program. Now, the traditional effect size largely uh, focuses on, on experimental studies where you have a control and you compare that control with a number of different treatments and see how far it deviates from that, that, that control treatment. However, we, we're thinking about situations where we have monitoring data. So this is about understanding how things change through time. But we would argue that the concept is still very similar and, and still as applicable. So what we would be doing is, is comparing a change in some biological parameter to a starting position or a baseline. And that, that change can be positive or negative, but what's the scale of that change in terms of the effect size, so the percentage change? And because we're monitoring, it's also important to understand not only the, the, uh, the absolute amount of change we're seeing, the severity of the impact, but also the rate at which that's happening, how quickly are biological impacts occurring, and how do they then relate to the speed and the severity of the ocean acidification carbonate chemistry changes that we're also seeing. Because by comparing the two, we start to give ourselves an opportunity to understand just how important ocean acidification is as a major driver in those biological changes we're seeing, or is there something else at play? So Sam, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so in essence, the concept that we're, we're looking to promote is the idea that time, people, who are looking to establish a time series would look to marry up a ocean acidification monitoring uh, program closely coupled with a biological monitoring program and our our intention at the moment is not to tell you exactly what that biological parameter is you're going to measure but more present to you op options and uh, an approach by which you could perhaps do that so i've i've kind of created some representations of, of what data might look like after many years of doing these observations. But the key thing is about this coupling up. This coupling up of, of the robust uh, ocean acidification carbonate chemistry monitoring at the same time over the same uh, um, geographical scale and time frame that you're doing the biological monitoring. And obviously you'll see that on the left, the ocean acidification monitoring gives us an appreciation of the annual rate of OA change. Uh, and as yet, you know, that could be one of the four indicators, pH, PCO2, DIC or alkalinity, um, compared to the rate at which our biological impact um, indicator is changing. But criti criti critically, please notice that in the biological monitoring, there's an extra step that's added, which is about standardizing these data to create a percentage change from the initial condition. But at the end of that process, we should be able to get some estimate of the rate of a biological change as a percentage of change through, through time. Sam, next slide, please. So if you can imagine that all over the planet, we've got uh, people running, uh, time series observations that are coupling up these chemical observations with the biological observations. We can start to bring together these data and plotting them on a, on a, on a, on a plot such as this, which would have on the, the y-axis the, uh, the rate of biological change per year. And again, 
it's very vague. I'm not specifying what that biological change is, but it's a measure, an indicator of the severity in which a biological process or attribute is changing. And then you compare it to the other axis, which we are perceiving to be the main driver. The assumption is that ocean acidification is driving this biological change. So we can therefore compare the rate at which that ocean acidification indicator is changing. And if we have enough observations from this global network, we can start to see if there's any relationship between biological changes or whether, uh, and, the, and the, chemis the chemical changes associated with ocean acidification. But more interestingly, not only is this giving us a, a, rep a graphical representation of what's happening around the world, it also gives us a really valuable tool by which we can go back into the data and start to understand and identify areas where there could be really interesting mechanistic understanding that needs to be developed. So next slide, please, Sam. So here I've identified one particular point on the graph, which represents a time series. And, and at this particular station, what we, we would theoretically be observing is high rates of biological change but in an area that's not experiencing uh, rapid ocean acidification. So there's obviously something of interest to explore there. So we could start to then study more, more deeply and using some of the, the uh, approaches that Sam highlighted earlier in terms of experimentation, more detailed examination to demonstrate cause and effect between OA or other drivers. But in essence, uh, the hypothesis we're testing there is either biological impact is caused by other environmental drivers at this station, not OA, or the biological process that we're actually chosen for that uh, time series is, is particularly uh, sensitive to OA and is actually responding much more rapidly to the changes in OA rel as would be expected when you compare to the way in which other uh, biological changes generically respond to similar types of OA change. Next slide, please, Sam. We now contrast this to another situation where another time series might throw up a different relationship between rate of biological change and that of rate of uh, chemical change. And in this area, we see very low rates of biological change that occur in areas that are actually experiencing really rapid ocean acidification as indicated by the carbonate chemistry monitoring. So what's going on here? You know, this gives us another insight. In this area, it could be that the monitored biological impact is not actually sensitive to ocean acidification, which with it brings all sorts of interesting questions about why is it in this area that a, that, that a biolog biological impact indicator chosen because it might well be uh, responding to OA isn't. What is it that's stopping or mitigating that response? Are there other environmental drivers at this, at this place which could be dampening down that biological response? So hopefully you can see that this is a, a, a kind of um, iterative process whereby the more observations we're able to gather together ac across different spaces, different times, different places, from different contexts with different indicators, the more it starts to give us an opportunity to then come back into the data and start to have targeted mechanistic studies which really bring up our general level and understanding of how biology and chemistry is related in these responses. Next slide please Sam. And of course, there's still some of the, the key metrics to be defined, to be understood from how we actually present these data, because it's, it's evident that biological change and also rates of ocean acidification might not always be in the same direction. We've made the natural assumption that ocean acidification is, is increasing everywhere, but of course we know it's not. There might be local places where ocean acidification is in fact running the other way. Uh, there may be areas where pH is, is going up, but, but why is that? What are the factors that are doing that? They may be very rare, but you know, there are there are cases where that might be that might be happening. And it might be that a increase in ocean acidification cause a decrease in a particular biological rate of change. But all of these things I think are manageable once we start to pull the data together. As an example, it may be possible that we consider biological impacts to be independent of the, of 
the, the direction in which they travel. So our assumption might be that when we bring all the data together, we might want to say that a deviation from the normal, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, is considered to be an impact. But those things, I think, come later down the line when we start to be able to draw together from the global network. Next slide, please, Sam. So that gives you a little insight into the approach we're taking. And the approach is very much not about the whole community must fall in line and do a small subset of observations. The approach by Goan is there is a wealth of skill, expertise, perspectives out there in the community. Can we find ways and mechanisms and methodologies to bring that together for something useful and something meaningful? And with that, I'll hand back over to Sam. Thank you, Steve. So uh, I can see that everybody is still there. We have uh, close to 200 participants now. So I guess you're still following the concept and, uh, and the idea. I hope you're going to stay with me because the next part will be a little bit complicated because in, in that, that part, we will try to, see, to, to show you how you can actually estimate several parameters if you decide, okay, in a certain location, oh, I want to start uh, some monitoring program. And again, I totally agree with Steve. We are not there to tell you what to, what to do. So ju just before I start a little bit of caution here, like uh, I, I, what Steve and I, we also say is that mon biological monitoring is valuable in itself. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to be linked to, to, to ocean acidification. And there is a value for biological monitoring. And of course, as, as Steve mentioned multiple times, we are not here to tell you what to do. We are just providing here with, with a concept, an idea that would allow us to work all together, which would be very, very powerful and interesting. Now, now what I'm going to try to talk about is, is how you may want to think if you want to select a new site for, for biological monitoring to, to optimize the chances to actually see effect of acidification over a reasonable amount of time. Because uh, what we know is that, as Greta Thunberg mentioned many, many times, the house is on fire. So we don't have 50 year or 100 year to actually address the problem of ocean acidification. We need to do that within the next decades. So in a way, one argument to start monitoring is because you want to actually see something in within the, the, the next few years. So that, that's, but that's not the only reason. That's what I wanted to say with the previous slide. Monitoring is interesting and very important in itself. And you may have other reasons to start an ocean acidification monitoring program. So don't worry, this is just one, one offer, what strategies that we want to show, but that's not the only one. So now let's say you decided, okay, I want to be part of, the, of this. I want to, to contribute to, to, this, to, this, to, this, to this new strategy where we combine chemical and biological, biological rate of change. But I, I, I want to choose a site where I have high chance to actually see something. And, and the biological rate of change will be modulated by two things. The biological sensitivity, more or sensitive is the species you choose or the process you choose and the chemical rate of change. And you can assume that the higher the sensitivity and the higher the chemical rate of change, the more chance you're going to have to actually see something during your biological rate uh, monitoring over a reasonable amount of time. So when you decide, okay, where you want to monitor to see biological change, the first thing would be like you want to be in a place where you're going to have sensitive species. And we know now from the, the, the large amount of, of papers that have been published over the last 10 years that there is a species specificity. Some species are more sensitive than others. Some populations are more sensitive than other. And, and so we already have some kind of information that allow us to, to at least have educated guess about where to go and find sensitive species. It could be in places, for example, where the carbonate chemistry is really stable. And we also know that the rate of chemical change is also depending on where you are. So it's going to change at different rates in different parts of the world. For example, it's expected to go faster in the polar regions. That could be another argument to choose your, your site. So basically, if you want to optimize your chance of having fast rate of biological change, you want to go in a place where you have sensitive species and fast chemical rate of change. 
And then that means that eventually that's going to shorter the period that you need to monitor to see an effect. And just to, to, to evaluate these things, actually what's one thing that could, one approach that can be really powerful is to use experimental data to, to make simple modeling to estimate how long you need to monitor. And I will give you one example that is based on where I work. So this is a picture from the Gulmar Fjord just in front of the institution where I work. It's a picture I took like a few weeks ago. So there we, we've been studying ocean acidification for a while now. And we know uh, from, from the local monitoring program for, for, the, for the Meteorological Institute that we have a rate of chemical change around minus 0 0.0044 pH unit a year. So that's the rate of chemical change that has been observed about, about over the, the, the last 15, 20 years now. So let, let's, let's assume that we have a rate of change like this. And then you can do biological experiment in the lab and understand the sensitivity of a given organism. And I will show you one example of, of a study we've done using blue mussels. So we basically collected blue mussels, made them spawn, and then exposed them to a wide range of pH between 7.1 and 8.1. And what you can see on the graph here is basically the performance curve of the muscle. So, and the parameter that we checked is the percentage of abnormality, which is an indicator of fitness. And what we could see is that there is very little abnormality in the higher pH and the lower the pH, the higher the number of abnormal larvae and it's close to 100% when you are at 7.2. And we can see that we have a tipping point around 7.6, 7.7. So, uh, so that, that's kind of, you can have like an idea of the performance, like how today the muscle perform, perform when you expose them to these different pH. So yeah, the approach we had with the biology working group is to combine these two information to see how, what would we observe if we were observing this parameter in the field over the year, assuming a fixed a chemical rate of change that I just showed you and a fixed biological response using that curve. And if you do that, basically you can have something like that. So you have the time here and then you would have the, the relative change in the parameter, which is the abnormality. And you can see this is what you would observe through time. So as expected, you would have an increase number uh, percentage of abnormality because of the negative effect of the pH. So over the time, the pH goes down and the percentage of abnormality increase. And then we made an estimation of what would be the maximal rate of biological change that you can observe using these data. And for that, we use a simplistic approach. We calculated the rate of change as the linear regression of the, of the curve. And then what you can see is that if you do it with the first 10 years of data, you have a biological rate of change. If you do it after 20 years, you have another one, another one, another one, another one. And if you plot that on the graph like this, you can see that the biological rate of change increase with the number of years of data. And what you can also see is that after 70 years, you start to have a plateau in this, meaning that you start to have a more robust estimation of the biological rate of change. So what you can see from there is that if you only have a few decades of data, you don't have enough data to fully estimate the biological rate of change. So using the data we had from the fjord here, if I wanted to start the monitoring program to evaluate the biological rate of change, that means I would need to have at least 80 years of data to have a robust evaluation of the rate of change. So that shows you that in a place where you don't have necessarily a really fast rate of, bio, of chemical change and a quite robust species, it might take a while before you actually see what you want to see. Uh, just another note of caution is that we made a lot of assumption for, for, the, for this simplistic evaluation, but just to show you that you can use information from the lab and information from the field to make calculations like this. But, but what you have to understand also is that we calculated the biological rate of change as a linear, so like a linear growth, and it's never like this in practice. So these are the kind of, of performance curve that you can have in reality, and they are never linear. So calculating the rate of biological change minus won't be as easy as a linear regression. It's going to be calculating using a more sophisticated model, but that's not, for, for the example we showed you now, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. 
But anyway, what, what we can see is that so far we kept constant the biological sensitivity and the chemical rate of change. But of course, these things can change through time. So if we change our policy for carbon emission, the rate of change might decrease or species sensitivity might actually decrease because of evolution or increase because of, of different reasons. So these things in practice won't be constant, but that's an assumption we took. And that's a good exercise to do if you want to start a biological prog uh, monitoring program to have at least a rough idea of how long you're going to have to to measure your things. But then you can also call, just to call, to show you practically how it would look like if you had in a certain location different rate of change. Uh, and, and how that would uh, lead to different measured biological rate of change. This is something we've done for using the same kind of data that I just showed you, but manipulating the rate of change. So before we kept the rate of change constant at this 0 0.0044 uh, pH unit per year, now we assume that we have three different rate of change. It could be low, like lower than what we show, I showed you, medium, which is the example I showed you, or high, which would be faster rate of change. And what you can see on this graph is that you have the, bio, the estimation of the biological rate of change, you, like I just showed you in the previous example, after 20, after 10 years, 30 years, and so on. So you can see it here in the different colors. So as I showed you before, the more data you have, the, fast, the higher the biological rate of change. And you can also see that the time you need to actually reach this increase with the chemical rate of change. So if you have a really high chemical rate of change, you, by 2050, you will have enough data to have a robust estimation of your biological rate of change. If you do it with a medium chemical rate of change, then it's different. You need 20 more years. And if you do it with a low chemical rate of change, then you, you will have to wait till the end of the century. So here is just a good example to show you that the more, uh, the lower the rate of ch chemical change, the longer you're going to need to monitor to actually see what you want to see. The other parameter that that will that may differ is also the species sensitivity. And as I said, species sensitivity might change through time because evolution can act and make the the species more resilient or more or less sensitive. So that, that's something we also decide to, 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 to model. So we basically use three different species with different level of sensitivity. So you have one that is really sensitive. So you're going to have already significant uh, biological response by if you expose them to 7.8. And then we make them less and less sensitive. And then we saw like how that would translate in your biological monitoring program. And what you can see is that if you have a really sensitive species, you have a much faster increase in the rate of, a much faster rate of change. And then if you do it with a medium sensitive or a low sensitive, and the time you're gonna need before you actually have a robust measurement will really depends on that too. So if you have a high, sense, a really high sensitive, really sensitive species, which is this example here, you're going to have a good estimate of your biological rate of change after 40 years. If you use a medium sensitivity, it's going to take 80 years. And you're not even close to have a real uh, estimation of the biological rate of change if you have a low sensitive, sensitive species. So again, this is not an argument against monitoring. It's valuable anyway. But the point is that if you really want to see something that is robust after a short period of time, you really have to identify places where you have high rate of chemical change and really sensitive species. So I'm not gonna go really far into the next part because that's, Steve already explained that really well, but there's also a really huge value in comparing what you're gonna see in the monitoring and what you have in the lab. Because if you compare that, you're going to see where there is discrepancies. And these discrepancies mean that we are missing something, that in the lab we are not taking into account something that is very important in the field. And this is very likely, of course. We, we In the field, you have multiple stressors, you have the whole ecosystem and so on. So comparing biology and monitoring is very important. So you can use laboratory studies to better prepare for your monitoring, but the monitoring can also give us a lot of information about to interpret what we do in the lab. 
So that's what I wanted to say. So remember, if you want to design a proper monitoring program and you want to see a response fairly quickly, think about like chemical rate of change that have to be fast, but also the, the, the biological sensitivity. I know I'm going to pass the mic to Steve, who is going to talk about the last part, which is what do you want to measure or what can you measure? Thank you, Sam. Yeah, and, and just to reinforce Sam's point there, um, biological monitoring is extremely valuable for a whole suite of, of activities and, and, and a lot of biological monitoring already goes on around the world. So what we're, what we're endeavouring to do is think how can we, we get greater value out of existing uh, biological monitoring by coupling it up with carbonate chemistry monitoring as well to give us an insight. But also, if people are considering starting up new monitoring programs, even if that's a monitoring program for another specific purpose, how can we consider adding a few things to that monitoring program to get additional value that would then help contribute to the GOAN effort of understanding the biological impacts of, uh, of ocean acidification? So, We've gone through this whole talk by saying we're not going to tell you exactly what to measure. Uh, this 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 comes down to a a, um, a personal choice in the context of of the monitoring that you want to do. But equally, Sam has also illustrated that those choices are really important in determining how successful you are likely to be in in identifying a. A, a, an impact of, of ocean acidification in a particular area, in a particular indicator. So, what we say is insisting that everyone measures the same small set of biological parameters is counterproductive because inherently it doesn't play to the strengths of the skills of the, of the broad community who are, who are looking to engage in this. Equally, it also shuts off avenues to, to us in terms of exploring the unexpected response. I'm a very strong advocate of a diversity of approaches, a diversity of, of, of subjects, because if we all focus too narrowly on the same thing, there's a chance we often miss the really interesting thing that no one's looking at. So I, I, I do strongly advocate a diversity of approaches, particularly when it embraces the relevance of different geographical areas, local scientific interests, and also people's own research capabilities and interests. And also we must understand, as Sam indicated, that the natural world is unlikely that the biological changes that we see are going to be solely driven by ocean acidification. So no biological measure that we could advocate will be a perfect indicator of OA change. However, there are some in which we can choose that tip the balance in our favour. So our approach would be to allow the monitoring community to choose from a wide variety of parameters and methods, provided that those methodologies are robust, so that there's nothing that gets away from the quality of the, the observations. So it's important that the methodologies used are, are of high quality and robust. But in essence, can we focus those observations in areas where we already have a, a fairly good understanding that elevated levels of carbon dioxide have a a direct influence over the physiological, behavioural, ecological processes which are important in governing those biological responses. So that is what we've done. We've identified five impact themes, if you'd like to call them, that focus on key biological processes for which we have some uh, strong evidence of mechanistic understanding to, to suggest that CO2 is playing a key role in the response of those, those attributes. So next slide, please, Sam. It will come as no surprise that the first one we call up is cal it's calcification. Calcifying organisms has been the poster child of ocean acidification research, and it's evident that there is, there is strong links between uh, ocean acidification, carbonate chemistry parameters, and the ability of organisms to create calcium carbonate structures. We also know that many organisms are reliant on those structures for protection uh, and also for sport support. So it seems only natural that uh, parameters that focus around the, the process of calcification would be really important to look at. 
But again, this isn't about just picking one or two. It's about understanding what it is you want to measure and how it relates to this process. So it's about choosing something that you feel has direct relevance to the ultimate theme, which is to understand how calcification is changing in a high CO2 world. So these, we, we've grouped a few of these things in terms of what it is you can actually go out and measure, but this is by no means an exhaustive list and other things can be added to this. And really it depends on what it is you've, you are comfortable measuring, what it is that relates to your particular area, particular um, subject of interest. So it can be something as, as fundamental as the relative pre uh, prevalence and success of calcifying organisms in an ecosystem. It could be, that could be done at an individual level or an ecosystem level. You know, the percentage of, uh, of calcifying organisms compared to non-calcifying organisms or the, 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 the um, you know, the growth rate of a, a calcifying organism over time. You can also look at the, the biostructure of the calcium carbonate structures that are formed by these organisms. We've seen a lot of fantastic evidence from uh, shell dissolution in pteropods as an indicator of ocean acidification impact. So the state structure, mineral composition of calcified biostructures will all help us start to get an understanding of how calcification might be changing. And then we get down to things like direct measurements of rate calcification. These are fantastic, but we accept that they're not possible for all. Uh, it's very, it's, it, it, it might be difficult for somebody coming new to the subject to, to deploy rather complex measurements of physiological rates of, of, of calcification. But there's, there's clearly something within here that I think most people could draw out that was relevant to the science they want to conduct and re relevant to the, to the monitoring program they wish to, they wish to um, instigate. Next slide, please, Sam. The next one concerns uh, primarily photosynthesis. So autotroph organisms and primary producers. So this, this idea that levels of CO2 could well have an influence on those organisms, particularly that use carbon dioxide as a, as a nutrient in essence. So as we, as we move away from calcification and into these other indicators, you will also start to notice that some of the other environmental dri drivers could be increasing in importance. So we're not saying that ocean acidification is the sole driver here, but what we are doing is identifying a strong mechanistic reason why CO2 could be playing a role. So in primary production, this, prim this primarily comes from the fact that we recognize that carbon dioxide is a fundamental fuel for the photosynth photosynthesis process. And yes, nutrients and temperature are gonna be really important, but by, by studying these kind of responses, we might be able to start teasing out the relative importance of the, of, of the various drivers. It's also worth noting that CO2 and pH can have indirect effects such as uh, regulating flag flagellary motion in, in some single cell organisms, which reduces motivity and therefore their ability to go and, uh, and scavenge nutrients. And also OA could change the chemical availability of essential micronutrients. So there's there are, there are realistic reasons why ocean acidification could be playing a part in biological changes in autotrophs and primary production. So how do we go about measuring it? Again, the same as calcification, there are some fundamental ways in which we can measure the relative success of autotrophs, be that through biomass and standing stocks. Uh, we can directly measure the productivity rates, how productive these animals or growth rates of, of, of large kelp or seagrass or primary production rates in, in single cellular phytoplankton. Another thing that we've added to the list is phenology. It could be that understanding the timings of when these, these organisms appear, when they grow, could well be a, a response to a changing climate. And it's worth understanding the, the time in which a bloom appears, the duration of a bloom, could also give us some really interesting insight into the success or not of autotrophs in a high CO2 world. Next slide, please, Sam. We're now moving a bit further along the trophic line through the trophic chain, and now we're considering heterotrophs. We're considering consumers. 
And there's a lot of experimental evidence to show that long-term exposure to high CO2 levels does increase the metabolic demands on organisms, and therefore the way in which they process uh, their, their energetic reserves to, to link into their ability to grow and reproduce. So we strongly believe that there, there's evidence that high CO2 levels could well impact upon the growth and success of consumers even if it's not through direct effects of, of CO2 on their internal physiology, but maybe through also the availability of food uh, in a world that's changing around them. So if you're looking to, to set up a monitoring program on, on the impacts of, of high CO2 on your consumers, on your heterotrophic organisms, on secondary production, we think there's, there's a, a huge amount of value in coupling those monitoring programs to a, uh, an assessment of the rate of change in ocean acidification parameters. And again, we're back to the concept of understanding how biomass or standing stocks might be changing. Is our growth rates causing the, the, um, the, the amount of these organisms to be decreasing in an area? Direct measurements of productivity rates, again, would be really interesting, understanding growth, growth rates, both for individuals and for communities and also phenology. So this, similarly that we saw with phyto phytoplankton, there, it could be that, and in this time I use the word phenology to describe uh, different life stages. When do different life stages appear? How long do organisms spend in the plankton? Are they spending more time in there, or less time in there? All these aspects of an organism's phenology could well be a really interesting indicator of the biological impacts that elevated CO2 is having on these organisms. Sam, next slide, please. And ultimately, we, we start to consider species mortality, species extinction rates, the loss of organisms, because whilst many organisms can, can buffer the changes of, of ocean acidification over periods of time, we know that ultimately they are, there are going to be some organisms that are so sensitive to ocean acidification, it, dri it drives mortality and ultimately to extinction. And in, in, in areas that could well result in a reduction in biodiversity, or even if it doesn't reduce biodiversity in terms of the total number of species, it could reduce the, the functional diversity of an area, the taxonomic richness of an area, or indeed just the relative distributions of different species and ultimately the community structure. So coupling up ocean acidification monitoring with those monitoring programs that look to explore aspects of community biodiversity and structure, community structure we think will also be incredibly valuable as well. Next slide, please. And the final theme that we, uh, we raised was about genetic changes, and I'll do my best to, <laughs> to portray this, but Sam might want to jump in because this is something that Sam has taken a very strong lead on. Um, we're, one big question that we're always asked about ocean acidification is, is it happening at a speed with which natural organisms, natural communities in the field might be able to adapt to or acclimate to? What is the buffering capacity of communities to be able to respond to those changes, to change their genetic makeup in order to select for those parts of the population which are just naturally more robust to the changes we're seeing? And whenever you look at a, uh, an ocean acidification paper, an a report on an experiment, you often look at the mean response of the different treatments and you very, very often ignore the, the error bars around that mean response. But those error bars around that mean response actually illustrate that not all individuals respond the same way. There's parts of the population that inherit in their, inherent in their genetic code, they hold an element of sensitivity to that challenge, just as some of them are, are incredibly insensitive and they're at the other end of that of that um, error bar but is there an, is there part of ocean acidification uh, through time which would actually start to select for those um, those um, sort of less vulnerable parts of the of the population and thereby shift adaptation towards a state whereby the community or the population themselves are buffering the change so 
Estimates of natural genetic variation in particular areas, functional gen genetic variation, and also estimates of mutation rates are going to be really important to, 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 to start to give us that understanding in different places at different times against different rates of ocean acidification change um, to start to help us answer that question. Uh, which brings me kind of the end to the end of those slides, but I will give Sam the opportunity now to come back in and perhaps further clarify or, or, or contradict anything I might have said in the, that last slide that the need, needs correcting. So back to you, Sam. I think you did a good job, so I'm going to leave it today. I think it's quite late anyway, so maybe we can go to the to the final conclusion. We can maybe do that together. Um, so, so basically, the conclusions again is like biological monitoring is interesting for a wide range of region re reason, and, and basically what we try to argue is that you can you can do it on top of an existing monitoring program, start a new monitoring pr program for many reasons, and add a, and have an added value for the ocean acidification community. Uh, any acidification specific biological monitoring program should be based on the question. So again, that's going to help you to identify what you want to do and, and the strategy we propose is more to have an approach that allows us to compare globally and work globally toward the same goal by comparing the chemical and the biological rates of change and and, and then we provided you hopefully with a few keys on on, on how to identify uh, good interesting areas if you want to see quickly this, this biological rate of change by focusing on sensitive species or places that are that have really high chemical rate of change and, and, and by using lab data and modeling data you can actually calculate or make rough estimate of how long it's going to take before you see something. And then we just went through the list of the key indicators that actually may help you to, 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 to optimize your chance of seeing something and actually tackle process that we know are sensitive to OA. So for us, the next step as a biology working group now will be to, to revise the article that we have. We send a copy to the, to the, 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 the committee of Goan and we already had a lot of really interesting comments. But if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you can do it now. You can send us uh, some emails, please. Please give us feedback. So we want to make this, this article as useful as possible for the community. And again, uh, Steve and I would like to thank the, the biology working group, the existing one, the previous members for their contribution and help. And I guess we, if we have time, we are happy to take any question. Sam, yeah. Sam, Steve, thank you so much for that uh, really wonderful presentation. Uh, this was the first uh, webinar in the Go On webinar series, and I think you both really knocked it out of the park. So thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time for questions. We only have about two minutes left. Um, but I think uh, a remedy will be we could start a conversation on the ocean acidification information exchange. So any question that we don't get to today, um, I will post on the OAIE, and we could really keep the conversation going there. Um, so uh, in, a, in a minute left, I will ask you uh, one question from um, Wiley Evans, who asked, what is the target chemical rate of change needed for the fastest time period for a robust determination of biological rates of change for a highly sensitive species? So um, highly sensitive species, high rate of change, what is that high rate of chemical change you would need? I agree. No, I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I think I, I would have to calculate. But when I did like really high rate of of, of change, which was something, I, mean, I, I used a rate of change that was similar to to uh, what we have here in Sweden. So this zero point zero zero forty four, and and I and I and I created like a fake, very sensitive species, and then you could actually start to see. By a good biological rate of change after a few decades. So I, I guess that's that 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 would that would be enough. But anyway, it's not like we, we can manipulate the chemical rate of change. And I guess we're going to have to do with what we have. And hopefully, this chemical rate of change will be really really low and lower and lower with time. Absolutely. So okay. Steve, yeah, yeah. I, I suppose to add to that, I know it sounds like a bit of a cop out, but I think <laughs> I think it's it's one of those things that. There's so many dependencies on that. What, what biological indicator you've chosen, how robust it is, um, you know, the context of, of how, you know, what is the historical rate of change that the organisms in your area have already been experiencing up until then. I think the beauty is that these are exactly the kind of um, questions we'll be able to 
to ask the data once we start to be able to bring in community data from across across the world so it, it does identify an interesting area which which could be a benefit of this sort of coordinated collaborative approach absolutely well we are uh, one minute past uh uh, our time, unfortunately. So as I mentioned, I will copy the questions and create a new post in the OA Information Exchange. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the inaugural uh, session of the Go On webinar series. And we'll be back next month with a, another webinar. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.